Greetings, old friends. Let us review the LBN Maximilian, this early version of the formidable Zweihander sword from Central Europe, the Holy Roman Empire. And we will examine how this medieval version of the two-handed sword bridged the gap between the 13th and 14th century great sword of war and this Renaissance version of the final form of the Zweihander with complex hilt. Today we have a special guest joining us, Matthew Jensen, who is the old guard of the sword review on YouTube. He is really the grandfather of the review style, scrutinizing every single component of the sword with close-up 4K shots, and he owns both the Maximilian and the Tyrolean, and some other similar comparable swords. In this review, he will provide some just suppositions and offer his thoughts and perspective. Hello there, sword friend Kane. I'm glad we have a chance to collaborate on this Maximilian and thank you for giving me cause to dust it off and actually finish this review because it's been a long time coming. Now, I have some comparing and contrasting to share with you as well as some thoughts that maybe might uh, give you something to pontificate on a little bit later in your review. But basically, I want to share with you some of the comparing and contrasting between this sword and others, and hopefully you and other sword friends find it useful. We know that the hand and half proportioned long swords were the favorite of knightly class as their battleground weapon and dueling weapons in case of trial by combat or tournament. But how did the smaller and more balanced long swords evolve into these two handed versions, essentially with enlarged blade and hilt? We have to examine the evolution of warfare in the late 15th century. Now, this sword is one of the three two-handed swords made by Albion, the other two being the Archduke and the Tyrolean, which both pay tribute to Germanic regions and their titles. In the late 15th century, there were continuous conflicts between various duchies and counties within the Holy Roman Empire over land and monetary transaction disputes, but also wars of succession in places like Burgundy. Way before his eventual ascension to the imperial throne, Maximilian I had to fight in the War of Burgundian Succession, and later in the Austrian-Hungarian War and the War of Landshut Succession as the Archduke of Austria. By the way, the title of Archduke was invented within the Habsburg domain to rival the prince electors of the empire. And in 1490, Maximilian I took possession of Tyrol for the House of Habsburg. So in a certain sense, the names of all three Zweihanders Albion ostensibly pay tribute to Maximilian I and to House Habsburg at large. After the Battle of Gingat that Maximilian personally fought in to defend his claim to the contested Duchy of Burgundy through marriage, he started to recruit mercenaries and formed a venture company by adopting the Swiss fighting model of Pike and Shot. This was later known as the Lens Connect, uh, essentially a professional army answering directly to Maximilian I's personal command during his lifetime to further the interests of the Habsburg dynasty. Among the feared Lens Connect mercenaries are the Doppelsortner, the doubly paid soldiers who enlisted with a good amount of high-quality armor and arms, such as Zweihanders and firearms, which were much more expensive to acquire than, say, simple pikes. There are competing theories on what the roles of the two-handed swords had. One theory is pike block disruption. The infamous Swiss model of pike squares was extremely effective at neutralizing the advantages of cavalry charges and flanking maneuvers. When both sides adopted the same tactics, they often found themselves at an impasse, and specialist units had to break this steelmate. Some people don't buy this theory, but I do think there is validity to it. Remember, the lens connect consists of primarily pikemen and arquebusiers were armed with primitive firearms, with a minority of halberdiers, only the 1% elite were wielding Zweihanders. Now, if you look at some long pole arms, uh, such as pikes, this one over here is actually a long spear rather than a pike. Pikes are even much longer, 
Obviously, if you want to hold this all day in a formation, this cannot be overly thick. All right, so the shaft is usually tapered in the diameter or the cross section. Over here, back when you hold the pike at the base, it's relatively thick. And as approach the tip or the spearhead, it's getting thinner. Obviously, near the head, at the end of the long lever, there's not a lot of mass. Uh, not to mention that if you get hit near the head, the leverage is working against you when you hold it by the end to maximize the reach of these long pole arms. The same can be said about halberds. Uh, the ones used by common soldiers are not the highly decorated ones you'll find in Renaissance times. Sometimes the shaft can be pretty long, so if you do a lot of fencing, uh, you understand for something like a sword, near the tip is called a foibo, the weak of the blade, because if you parry at this portion of the blade, uh, the leverage is working against you, so your blade is easily knocked aside than, say, parrying near the base of the blade. So having an all-steel blade uh, that's still very large and hefty definitely has certain advantages over long pole arms. If you are heavily armored, you can afford to get hit a few times without getting injured. And if you hit a number of pikes near the head, obviously it's easier to knock them aside, especially the great sword has so much more mass. Now, indeed, you can also do the same with a halberd. But remember, you can only damage or gain advantage with a halberd strike against pikes if you hit the shaft of the pike with the head of your halberd. Now, these halberds have pretty short bladed section made of metal. So you have to really have some good aims. Also, it's really difficult for you to hit multiple pikes with a halberd head. Now, you can imagine it's far easier because these two-handed swords have such long blades, so it's possible to hit multiple pikes at a time. Now, the goal isn't necessarily breaking them in half. You can knock them aside, which is more effective than knocking them aside with a pike, because if you do the same, you'll be hitting their pikes with also the weak part or the light part of your pike. So it's just not as effective. Also, if you manage to chop into the pike, even though you don't necessarily chop them in half directly, you might damage the shaft. And over time, they might break. Also, if you knock them to the ground and you step on them with um, a sabaton, it's very likely to break the pike, damage them, to make them non-functional, especially when you consider most people wielding these Zweihanders are really large and strapping dudes. So it's certainly a plausible tactic. Now people question the practicality of these so-called suicide missions. If you send your men with large stature and high skill bars and while being well equipped uh, to die essentially on these high risk missions. But remember, you don't send them in front of your pike you mix them with your pikemen. So during the stalemate, you can gain an advantage. And these well-armored men are also flanked by their pike-wielding compatriots. So they're not going in alone. They are still well protected. It's kind of a mixed unit tactics. Suffice to say, people who enlist with high quality arms and armor, but also proven to be skilled in martial capacities would likely to become double soldier, the doubly paid soldiers. And we can definitely see the close association of the large Zweihanders along with armor uh, in a correlation to the doubly paid soldiers. The other competing theory is that during pike block stalemates, there will be chaotic melees and the troops will drop their pikes and draw their iconic sidearms, such as the Kasbogger and Grossmeisters. 
and the large size cutting orient two-handed sword, such as this uh, Albion Maximilian here, indeed has such an advantage in these uh, melees. If you compare their sizes, <laughs> which is kind of laughable as this uh, Kasbauger arming sword is essentially about half the size and less than half the mass of this large two-handed sword here. Obviously, you can imagine the reach advantage, but also the sweeping strikes can occupy multiple opponents, especially the wielder protected by like the three-quarter or even full plate harness. So your compatriot can take advantage and win the day in this chaotic melee skirmish. The Maximilian, named after Maximilian I, the patriarch of the Habsburg dynasty, is the most premium offering amongst all three. And indeed, it features very iconic risen geometry on the hill furniture, the cross guard, and the pommel. Obviously, this style is closely inspired by late 15th century Germanic type of spiral and risen hilt. One of the most famous examples is the Schloss Erbach sword. It gives an air of sophistication without being overly gaudy. Calling this a two-hander great sword or Zweihander will challenge the notion of the typical Zweihander's Montante's Spadone appearing in pop cultures as sword as tall as a person with a complex hilt, usually depicted with side rings and sometimes swept hilt as well. Contrast to popular belief, those swords were only used in the late 16th to 17th century. The earlier version, the very late medieval versions of these two-handed swords, usually are furnished with only plain cross guards and just a pommel, usually with sense stopper geometry. Indeed, if we look at some of the surviving symbols in museums, for example, the Wallace Collection 8.474 and Royal Armory's Section 9.1787, both English versions of two-handed swords with elongated blades but also enlarged hilt. Although those differ from the ones popular in Germanic regions by having more slender blades, usually with a more traditional diamond cross section, popular in the 15th century. In contrast, two-handed swords made in Germanic regions made liberal use of a technology known as fluting. Examples being Royal Armory's Exhibit 9.1 and Maximilian I's personal Zweihander made by Hans Sumersberger, now on display at the Imperial Treasury in Vienna. Fluting came into prominence in the second half of the 15th century and became even more prevalent throughout the Renaissance. The idea is to have a group of ridges and grooves on a given metal surface, so the raised ridges have the thickness to enhance the strength comparing to a flat metal plate made of the same amount of material. But the grooves in between can reduce the overall mass comparing to a flat plate of the same thickness as the ridges. And this is found both on armor and weapons, such as swords. Therefore, you can have a broader blade overall to deepen the depth of the bevel. So the edge angle in this case will be smaller and makes the sword overall conducive to cutting. And if you look at the silhouette of the blade, this is very comparable to some of the earlier gray swords for war that we have covered on this channel. You see, they don't feature a lot of profile taper in the blade, meaning that the width of the blade doesn't narrow down as much along the blade from the base to the tip, compared to long swords that came later in the 14th and 15th century. If you look at those long swords, the width of the blade and the portion below the tip is often one third and even one fifth in some extreme cases of the width of the base. There are a few effects of greater degrees of profile taper. Number one is the mass distribution and the resulting handling characteristics. We understand that swords have the feature of carrying far less mass near the tip than the base. This is accomplished by having both profile taper by narrowing down the width of the blade as it travel along the blade reaches the tip, but also 
tapering in the thickness called distal tapering. Near the foible, or the upper portion of the blade, it carries much less mass than the base. So swords, comparing to axes or war hammers, carry most of the mass near the hilt or near the hand of the operator. So they can be relatively nimble. They are speed-oriented weapons. Even this great sword that weighs five and a half pounds, I can use it in one hand. You can hardly say the same about war hammers or axes. Those are very top heavy. And among all swords, late medieval long swords are exemplars of this mass distribution attribute. Their prominent profile taper combined with the distal taper, meaning the thinning of the blade's thickness and the change of cross section, the blade carries progressively yet noticeably less and less mass as it travels from the base to the tip, making long swords extremely easy to accelerate when you swing them and easy to stop or redirect, which means the tip is extremely agile and precise, all to the benefits of technique-oriented sword fighting. Take the Albion Ringneck longsword from the late 14th century and the early 15th century, for example. The mass of the tip is only less than 6% of the mass near the base. Therefore, it's extremely swift and nimble in motion. In contrast, the Maximilian doesn't taper nearly as much in the profile, but there's still a demonstrable amount of narrowing in the profile. At the midpoint of the blade, it's 20% narrower than the base, and near the tip, it's 40% narrower than the base. Sort of like a minor but linear profile taper. Now, Matthew reported that he found little distal taper on the blade of the Maximilian, but I found the complete contrary as the base is 7.6 millimeters thick. That's really thick for such a broad blade. Much thicker than the Albion Baron Great Sword of War, which sits at 6 millimeters at the base. This is probably a blessing from using fluting on the Maximilian's blade. It sinks down dramatically to 4.4 millimeters at midpoint and down to 1.8 millimeters at 2 inches from the tip. It's a fairly linear distal taper that causes the blade to be gradually sent down to only a quarter of the thickness at the base. If you factor in only the profile taper and distal taper, the Maximilian sheds about 85% of the mass from the base to the tip. But that's not the whole picture. You see, the blade has the twin fillers at the bottom half of the blade, and the top half has just a plain hexagonal cross-section, meaning that there's additional mass taken out by these fullers on the lower half of the blade. And the top half isn't as meager as it seems with the absence of the fullers. So when you compare the handling of the Maximilian to the Ringneck, or even the Regent, that's more balanced between cut and thrust, the Maximilian carries exponentially more authority in the swing. This isn't just because it's 50% heavier overall, but the way how all that mass is distributed along the blade. Effect number two of the profile is that the blade on long swords can transition into a narrow yet still thick cross section. So the operator can find the small gaps of plate armor and jabs the tip through the male armor and garment underneath the plate armor. The Maximilian's blade doesn't taper as much in the profile, causing the blade to be still quite wide but rather thin near the tip. This tells us that this kind of sword doesn't have thrusting and combating armor in mind, but rather the wide and thin blade can have very small edge angles that are conducive to the cutting performance. Because you cannot cut through steel plates, we can infer that two-handed swords with profiles like the Maximilian are meant to combat opponents clad in only textile protections, such as gambeson or even plain clothes. These swords rely on primarily fearsome cleaving powers rather than precise and quick cutting and thrusting.
once a swipe handler like this gets swung, it's intuitive for the operator to follow the flow of the authoritative blade to come around with continuous swing in large arcs rather than responsive stops and redirections like binding and winding in long sword fencing. That doesn't mean that the Maximilian is a complete ineffective sword at thrusting. Jamming that thin tip into an unarmored opponent's face can still cause grievous wounds, obviously. And half-sorting the blade by grabbing the base can help with jabbing with it like a spear. This cut-centric mentality of Zwei handers is very similar to the usage of earlier great swords of war, like the Albion Baron, just further scaled up in size and mass, only not yet to the scope of the late 16th century Renaissance Zweihanders, which are often as big as a person. If we compare this uh, Le Madeo Zweihander against the earlier Great Sword of War, which were first introduced to Europe in the late 13th century and early 14th century, Great Sword of War doesn't mean that they were considered great swords, but they are bigger version of the sword of war used on the battlefield. As the armor technology evolved, and knights started to put on more plate components over their all encompassing male armor, they can forego the shield and pick up these two-handed versions of the sword of war and maximize their cutting capacity against lightly armored opponents on the battlefield. However, as you can see, when they feature a broad blade, usually tapered to be much thinner on the upper portion of the blade, the longer the blade gets, the more flexible the blade becomes. And we know that a flexible blade is less stable and less conducive to consistent cutting performance. So they'll have to keep the length of the blade in check or making the blade overall thicker to be stiff enough and durable enough. Indeed, we do find some larger versions of these great sword of war in the 14th century and 15th century. They are extremely heavy, usually weigh between 10 to 15 pounds, and sometimes they are even taller there in person. Most archaeologists will consider them to be only bearing swords used in ceremonial circumstances at parades and such. So these functional versions of the great sword of war will have more tamed blade lengths and as technology progressed, the situation changed to enable a greater blade length. And this is where the fluting comes in. If you look at the earlier great source of war, you see that they usually feature a fuller to reduce weight and overall having a lenticular blade to be thin yet still somewhat durable. Now fast forward two centuries onward, these late medieval Zweihanders have a hexagonal cross section instead of the lenticular one, meaning that there are two soft ridges on the surface of the blade to make the central facet more durable, but also more rigid. And you typically find multiple fullers on these Zwei handers. At least two are found on most of them. And then you examine the resulting cross section. Instead of one central ridge, they have effectively three ridges. That's the thickest part of the blade. The rest of the blade can remain relatively thin. So overall, the blade will not be overweight. It still have enough thickness. Obviously having three ridges as the thickest part of the blade will ensure the rigidity better than having just one central ridge. Some of these swords, usually referred to by your oak shot as the type 20 swords, have more than even two fullers. Some have three at base and transitions into bifuller in the mid section of the blade. And in that case, the three fuller will produce four ridges on the blade. Indeed, even though this blade is 41 inches long, you see it is quite rigid. Although if you flex the blade, yeah, there's still enough flexibility to ensure the durability when it clashes against pole arm hafts. Uh, but also if you cut through bones, they will remain intact. If you look at the hexagonal cross section of the blade, you see that the edge angle remains small to enhance the cutting performance and it transitions into a relatively thick part of the blade to ensure durability. So it will less likely to be bent and deform. If you look at the hilt of the blade, you see that it's basically an enlarged version of the earlier medieval hand and a half proportioned swords. So 
you have a much longer grip space to utilize the leverage to maneuver these Zwei handers. And weight-wise, this great sword war with 37-inch blade weighs four pounds. While this uh, Zwei hander here has a 41-inch blade and 55-inch overall lens, weighs 5.4 pounds. So definitely, this is a sword that requires proper strength and even stature to wield. Obviously, if we compare the usage of these two-handed swords to some medieval longsword techniques, you have to modify them somewhat, as these swords are pretty thin up here for optimized cutting performance, but also relatively lively handling characteristics comparing to things like pole axes. Still, they are much slower than longswords. It takes longer to accelerate to reach its terminal velocity that generates the maximum damaging potential. And also, the length of the blade makes you not being able to cut with an oblique angle, but you have to use it primarily in a horizontal way to cut. Have these sweeping strikes against multiple opponents, but if you cut too vertically, it will dip to the ground and damage the tip. So we'll see the beginning of Montante as one-hander usage. And it differs from the nimbler longsword techniques then those are quicker and more versatile techniques with lots of these wrist-twisting motions. Obviously, you can still do that with the handers False edge cuts can be relatively easy to pull off, but to find someone with long swords, with these great swords, the white handers you have to utilize your reach advantage to the maximum in order to defeat them because speed is not on your side. And if you are one of the bodyguards that carry these swords to protect your employer or these swords, your primary concern in case of an ambush is to keep multiple assailants at bay with these sweeping strikes. Now, what's interesting is these stereotypical Zwei hunters usually come with complex kilt and even larger blades in popular cultures. But if we put this late medieval Zwei hunter against this late 16th century style, this one in particular is a Venetian style of Zwei Hander, or Spadone in Italian. You see that uh, there's a lot of similarity. Within a century, swords has evolved somewhat, and one of the features is the recastle at the bay to introduce extra mass and durability uh, to the blades of the blade, so you can parry more effectively with the forte of the blade, but also having more mass at the blade will ensure that the blade is even more nimble overall because the blade carries more mass comparing to the top of the blade. Another feature introduced in the 16th century is these lugs just past the recastle of the blade. These are more conducive to parrying and a blade sliding down the edge when you parry will usually be caught by these lugs instead of coming all the way down to the hilt uh, to threaten your hand. And also, you can see they have large rings on the sides to further provide protections to the hands and forearms of the wielder. But if we just look at a style of hilt, you see that, yeah, they are pretty comparable. They both have these risen style of sense stopper pummel. This one by Deltin has a longer stock before it transitions into a globe. So it provides extra hand space this is also seen on the Albion Tyrolean, which features a more plain sense of pummel that resembles a doorknob. But as Maxwell Jensen pointed out, it's more comfortable as what is doorknob being used while being held by hand and twisted. A doorknob is a handle, and it's a great handle that's practical, providing extra space with the stock. So visually, it will be less stunning, yet overall more practical, generating less hot spots on the hilt. When I handle the Massimilian, I didn't really find any problem. When I handle the hilt components, they are very comfortable. But I suppose it's possible to catch a fingernail in one of these grooves. And you can just look at the proportion of the 16th century Zweihander. It's basically an even large version of the earlier Zweihanders, having longer grips, longer pommels, and wider cross guards to accommodate the even longer and heavier blades. Now, 
let's hear Matthew Jensen's thoughts on comparing and contrasting the Maximilian to a number of other sorts. The first is the most like for like that I can share with you, and that is the Albion Tyrolean and the Maximilian. So effectively, these are the same sword with different hilts, or at least the same blade with different hilts. And it might surprise you to find that I like the Tyrolean more. <laughs> now, not necessarily in appearance. The Albion Maximilian is absolutely stunning looking. You obviously bought one, I bet, in part that has to do with just how cool looking it is. But the Maximilian seems to get all of the attention and the Archduke and the Tyrolean don't get so much. But having both, I can compare and contrast them. And it, it's more or less the controllability is why I like it. I like the look of the Maximilian more. And the fluting offers some additional grip. It's like a cherry on top, though. These swords are big and, in general, uh, I struggle to control them. And the doorknob at the bottom of the Tyrolene just gives me something to hold on to and the way it moves in my hands feels more comfortable. I feel more in control of the weapon and I happen to like it more. So that's really it. The the wasting on the Tyrolene though, the grip is enormous and bulbous in the center. Maybe it's just mine, but it's really, really quite large. And I wish I could thin it down just a little bit because I end up choking up really high on the cross guard when I grab the sword. Either way, though, I happen to like the, the Tyrolene a little bit more, and it's because I feel like I'm in more in control when I move it around. The Maximilian, though, takes the cake in terms of appearance, but the Tyrolene I feel a little bit more in control of, and that's, well, at least that's what I'm there for. I, I want to be in control of the weapon. <laughs> now, the, the other swords that I can compare and contrast them to, I have a long Angus trim sword, and this is obviously a completely different sword. It's not at all at all in the same league, but it is quite long, and what it illustrates is that Big swords don't necessarily have to be immobile. If I move around the Maximilian, it feels like I have to concentrate, like I have to be very deliberate with my movements, that they have to flow from one to another. And there's a particular way that I don't, I don't understand to move it around. In contrast, this smaller Angus trim sword is similar in length. It might even be a little bit bigger, and I feel like I can move it in one hand. I feel like I can move it in two, and I feel like it, while is long and awkward, is more or less an extension of my arm. And it goes to show that length isn't what's doing it. It's it's really the combination of length and mass that are making it feel so so cumbersome and different to move around, or so at least antithetical to the way that I've moved swords around in the past. The other one that I want to share with you is the uh, Schloss Erbach sword from Arms and Armor. Now, I think it was you that actually mentioned that they share some similarity, or one may have inspired the other. So the Schloss Erbach is a uh, Type 18B sword, I believe, and the uh, the Maximilian is a something else sword, <laughs> but the, the Quillins obviously share some similarity. Notice, though, that the Quillins on the Schloss Erbach sword are not symmetrical, they're not even. This is cast, I believe, from the original pieces on the Schloss Erbach sword, so it's it's pretty one for one in terms of the the museum uh, that, or the, the, the sword that it is emulating. I believe they're cast from the original pieces and not created, so it's, it's a reasonable one-for-one -one replica. But you can see that the, the twists are not necessarily even, and they also peter off into nothing and would be better suited with little caps. The fluting on the pommel as well is similar, but do notice that the, the pommel on the Schloss Erbach sword is not even. It's kind of oblong. Some of the lobes are bigger than the others. It's not perfectly evenly twisted. And notice the difference between that and the Albion. The Albion has some additional grooves as well that I think... I think they've zazzed it up with their ability to, uh, <laughs> to to cast those additional details in and share them and have them be more symmetrical. Uh, to my eye, I find that pleasing anyway. Uh, effectively, though, they are very, very different swords. Obviously, this is a two-handed great sword. It's quite a bit bigger. It's quite a bit heavier. The Schloss Erbach sword has similarities in the pommel, but that's, that's about it. If I go then to the Arms and Armor German Bastard Sword, it's Quite a bit different. Strong central ridge section, not quite as long, and quite a bit more in the way of, of the hilt. It feels like I have a lot more hand protection in the German Bastard Sword, even though it also has a, a large spherical pommel on the on the bottom. It's, it's different. Um, I feel like I'm able to actually deliver a thrust as well as a cut, but I feel like I can move the sword effectively like a bigger version of what I normally use and not like something completely different, which is, again, what, what tends to happen with these two-handed greatswords from Albion. The last one that I can share is the Ulbricht, I think is how you pronounce it, from Dark Sword Armory. And this is something I haven't reviewed yet, but more or less it is also a big sword, not quite as big. It also has fullers that run a little bit longer. It also is a little bit on the heavier side, but just the, the length, even though the weight may be not quite similar, this is a lighter sword, but even though this is a big sword and a heavy sword, uh, the fact that it is shorter, again, makes me able to move it around a little bit more similarly to how I do a normal sword. Now, I have to keep two hands on it, but I feel like I can start momentum, I can stop it, I can control it, I can deliver a thrust where I want to, 
when I try those same techniques with the with the Maximilian, it's just beyond my reach a bit. I don't I don't have the strength to maneuver it the same way that I do in the the way I would typically swing a sword. Just seems inapplicable, and it's it's interesting that it's a nuance between length and weight. <laughs> if I have a heavy sword. I can still move it around if it's not quite as long. If I have a long sword that isn't as heavy, I can still move it around. But the Maximilian and the Tyrolene and the other two-handed offerings from Dark uh, from from Albion seem to seem to be in this space where I need to use a technique I don't understand and haven't practiced. And I don't know if that's been your experience or not. But anyway, that's a comparing and contrasting some of the other swords that are maybe in the same ballpark in some areas, uh, certainly not in others. That and and how they are prattling around in my mind. Now I have to agree with Master Jensen's assessment that this is probably not the ideal sword for a practitioner to practice cutting regularly because of the great mass and the size. If you just want a long sword to practice using different techniques to hone your skills at cutting and thrusting, you probably should pick a smaller offering, uh, Albion or other renowned sword makers. However, if you do want a full-blown, hefty Zweihander, this is probably the thing for you. Personally, I enjoy greatly these ornate hilt components with risen geometry. They just add an air of sophistication without being overly gaudy. Now, would I recommend the Albion Maximilian? In short, no, but it is going to depend on who I'm talking to. If you're a person that's saying, I want a two-handed five-pound greatsword and I want it to look pretty, this is your guy. It's an excellent looking sword. It is really well built. It's going to hold its value as many Albions do. It seems to have almost a cult following around it. So if you, if you want that and you know what you're getting into, awesome. Have fun. Enjoy. If you're not, if you've never held a five-pound sword before, if you've never held, handled the Archduke, the Tyrolean, the Maximilian, or any sword in its weight class and size, then I would just say hopefully check one out before you do. They move a little bit differently, and if your plan is to have a sword on your wall for an oh-shit situation or to go out in the backyard and cut some stuff for fun, this isn't fun to do that with, at least not in my opinion. I like to move the Principe and the Alexandrian, other big imposing-looking swords that maybe are, are dwarfed by this one, but... Uh, it doesn't move the the same way, and I'd urge you caution because uh, if if this were the only sword that I had, uh, backyard cutting would would not be as fun to me <laughs> as it is. I'd probably be better at swinging it around, but I would say it would be a little a little harder to justify getting out there and just cutting a few bottles for fun. And it certainly wouldn't be something I'd ever want to use indoors. You'd have to like train to use a spear indoors. It's it's a different kind of thing. So that's that's the only reason I say no is I don't personally find it very enjoyable to cut with, and I don't. I don't know that a lot of people would. The backyard fun is just not there for me. It's big and cool, but it, it requires investment from me and something that I, I don't frankly want to invest much in. So those are my thoughts. It's still an awesome sword though, and I can't blame you if you want a big ass sword like this. Uh, it, it's a hell of a sword to get. Anyway, thanks for having me along, King. Much appreciated. Cheers. Now, one thing I definitely agree with Master Jensen is that this sword is definitely not for the faint of heart. You have to consider whether this is the wisest choice to be your first sword or one for you at all. Now, if you look at the size, the pommel reaches my sternum. Now, I'm six feet one. Uh, definitely uh, can, can be considered a large man, weighs 210 pounds. And if I have to do a drill with this sword for 10 to 15 minutes, it's definitely a workout for me. And Master Jensen, is quite large as well and you can see it's not easy for him to wield this sword other than the size there's the heft 5.4 pounds it's just about 50 percent heavier than uh, a regular long sword that's only about 10 to 15 percent smaller than this one so you can see the weight to size ratio is quite substantial Obviously, if you are patient enough to study Montante, uh, Zweihander, Spadone treatises, and you do regular drills, this is the perfect sword for you, provided that you're skilled enough to handle the sharp blade without injuring yourself. Matthew mentioned that he has some trouble cutting with his sword. Obviously, I think the sharpness of the edge, specifically the apexing, plays a role, as LBN has some trouble in the past sharpening their edges to the ideal apexing level for test cutting. Obviously, if you have any sharpening devices, skills with uh, grinding wheels, 
uh, or things like work sharp, you can sharpen the edges quite easily as the edge geometry is excellent. Otherwise, being such a long bladed sword is not very forgiving uh, in test cutting. You have to get the edge alignment correct, especially you have to forego the more vertical strikes to better utilize the gravity. You have to do more horizontal sweeping strikes in order to prevent hitting the ground and sometimes the ceiling as well. Now, it's worth mentioning that uh, in the year 2023, all the swords I received from LBN had pretty adequate edges. So obviously you can buy the newer ones from LBN directly, you stand a better chance at acquiring an adequately sharp sword. Still, I wouldn't call this edge razor sharp. If I have to do competition cutting with the sword, I'm gonna hone the apex a little bit more. But remember, if you receive a second-handed one made years ago, it's quite common to have dollar edges and it wouldn't be conducive to good cutting performance at all. After I showcased my Maximilian online, both Julian Schutte and Matthew Cross contacted me to confirm that the LB and Maximilian to be their favorites and perform extremely well as a two-handed sword at cutting. Julian Schutte is a longsword and polearm instructor, the president and founder of the Historical Combat Collective, and the high-level contestant in historical European martial arts tournaments and advanced sword cutting competitions. Some of you remember him from Scalagrim's videos. And given his background handling large weapons, he operates the Maximilian with ease. You can see even false edge cuts on tatami mats went effortlessly. Massive Cross is a professional sharpener, sword collector, cutting enthusiast, and hilt smith. He also finds the Maximilian to be extremely proficient at cutting with both the front and back edge. You can see how crazily clean this horizontal cut went. The perfect flat incision is a testament of the ease of handling of this beastly large sword. Note that both Shute and Cross are large men who enjoy handling big swords, and I think the keys here are additional sharpening of the edges and the technique of utilizing the sword's own momentum instead of fighting it. Now let's look at my performance using this sword. We know it cuts light targets well. How about the large, dense, and composite mass? That's a good estimation of human combatant. This is 9 pounds of 15% ballistic gel that simulates muscle, a milk jug shell that simulates the skin, and the soaked wooden dowel to simulate bone, held down onto the stand by nothing but its own weight. Ooh. 
Wow, that was some interesting data. See, this is about 22 inches in circumference, so slightly thinner than my own thigh. And this gel is quite firm and rigid with a little bit of jiggly flexibility, just like muscle. It has better resistance against cut, but worse resistance against tear than animal flesh. Obviously, this is not as tough uh, against abrasion as skin. So you can see this outer shell of the jug provides that estimation of skin. This is a soaked wooden dowel. It's still pretty dry and it's quite hard. You can see it got cut completely through. Incision is quite smooth, actually. Not as sick as human femur, but remember, living bone is flexible and not dry or brittle and as hard as dead bone. So it's easier to cut. Obviously, it's not as sick, but remember, animal bones are hollow in the center filled with spongy bone marrow. So that offers practically little resistance. And we can see that the incision goes very smoothly up to about, I'll say three quarter, four fifths of the cross section. And it just got carried through the rest. Very interesting data. So a relatively accurate human thigh analog. Uh, well, it's not as heavy. Altogether, it weighs about nine pounds. So nowhere near the mass of the entire person holding down the material being cut, but Hey, you gotta use what you have. Obviously a person standing firm with structure and guard stance will provide more resistance than the nine pounds of ballistic gel. But still, this is way better performance than I thought. And you can see that they still tear the rest of the flesh through. And when they fell onto the ground, it kind of broke. In any case, this is a testament of the fearsome cutting capacity of the Zweihander. Could have been sharper, but I think this is adequate because this is expected to meet polearm shaft, uh, other blades, so it's difficult to sharpen the edge to uh, razor and that will suffer a little bit more deformation. Obviously, there's practically little change dulling to the blade. This is the second cut. You can see the depths. Very clean, very smooth. Also, cut the dowel completely through. The dowel is cut here. There's no tear at all. The cross section is a little bit thinner than the first cut. So I would say it's rather consistent. Basically, you can expect it to cut through a human thigh that's not protected by gambeson or steel armor, that is. You can see one light chop cut the whole thing cleanly through. Still, the incision is about, I'll say, five to six inches deep. No problem at all for a Zwei Hunter. And you can see the stab wound from the thrusting here. Because of the white tip, it cut through the gel. Didn't go in very deep. You can even see the pattern here, resembling the tip geometry of this white hander. I would say going in about three to four inches because there's not much mass holding it down. So it just bounced off the stand. Still very substantial. You can see all the way to the bone. So let's look at the property of this material, this gel. 15% gelatin, which is higher percentage than the FBI certified ballistic gel. 
So a little bit denser, a little bit more resistant and firm. You can see it held down to the form rather well. And yeah, I would say it's a quite adequate analog of uh, human muscle. Yeah, not so much with the skin. That will have to be simulated by the shell, the jug, and the bone. You have to put in a dowel. I have to remind you that this is substantially harder to cut than living bone. The fit and finish is on par with LBN's usual level, which is pretty much the ideal for modern sword making. It combines modern technologies such as milling, but also powered tools with hand precision. So these are still handcrafted from the blade to all the hilt components. The guard and the pommel were hand carved by Peter Johnson himself and being made into cast mold. They're indeed cast, but then being hand ground to have this satin finish to mirror the polish of the blade. If you look at the geometries on the pommel, they're not completely symmetrical. They're 99% there. The really the hallmark of Albion swords is that their sword still feels handmade. They're not churned out by machines. They're being touched by humans. Yet still, it has a lot of attention to detail, but also great craftsmanship and time putting on each piece to appear almost perfect and flawless. Yet still, if you look closely, there are enough smaller flaws to still give it an organic feeling. This grip is the usual Albion's wasted geometry with a hexagonal cross section, which is one of my favorite, just as the one on the Albion region, my favorite longsword. You see they have risers, two on top and two at the bottom, and two at the center as spacer for your two hands to space out. But also the cord wrapping on the grip is very even, it provides enough traction, it's still very comfortable. But unlike the usual Albion's grip, they're not very thin. This one and other two-handed sword offerings have girthy handles. They're not just long, but they are thick and wide, but not overly so. My hands, my fingers can still well wrap around the grip at the top and the bottom. And this is due to the tapering. This weight section is the thickest and broadest part of the grip. At the top, near the cross guard where you hold the sword with your main hand is a center, so it's still pretty easy to maneuver given its size and heft. And just as usual, all of these transitions are very flush. They have all the leather wrapping tucked in. There's no hot spot at all. On the cross guard, the aperture to fit the blade is very tight, even though this one is not as tight as some of the other offerings, but it's just among the best. Obviously, you don't really need an opening this tight on medieval swords because many of them have larger openings. What's really important is that you have a seat in the middle of the aperture of the guard so the base of the blade, the conjunction to the tan, can sit in there tightly. There wouldn't be any movement and it's hard for fluid to go into the slot of the tan. But I still enjoy this tight fitting this small tolerance just shows the overall quality and attention to detail at Albion swords. You can look at the Vag 10 quality of the grip, which has a mottled finish. And this grass green, which I totally enjoy. I, I got green leather wrapping on some other Albion swords, the Albion Kingmaker, and it looks totally different from this one. So I have to appreciate the variety Albion provides in terms of grip coloring. And obviously you can also choose the option with a half steel wire wrap and with the region in my possession, I can tell you that it's well worth it. In that case, you have to be aware that the upper portion of the grip with all the steel wire wrap is not cord wrapped. So it probably has less traction than these cord wrapped ones. So you just have to make up your mind which version you prefer. And also those half steel wire wrapped ones are more expensive. Personally, I would recommend the steel wire wrap one because it's really a um, feature found on late medieval swords and especially Gothic ones. And if you pair that with the antiquing order blackening of the hill components, the steel ones, it will really look great. If you look at the finishing quality of the blade component, it's on par with Albion's usual. 
the edges of the hexagonal cross section are relatively well defined, but these are rather soft ridges than the very crisp central ridge, especially one with the hollow ground geometry. All the edges of the fillers are really straight, well defined, yet still being hand ground. If you look at the termination of the fillers, they terminate to almost the exact same spot, but they are not exactly 100% symmetrical. So this adds a feel of being handmade, yet still, if you compare it to both uh, swords made by other production companies today, but also 15th and 16th century originals, uh, this is definitely top 1% of quality. I have to also comment on the durability of the sword. Uh, during the cutting, I cut into the stand accidentally. I stabbed the tip into seating and the ground accidentally. None of them suffer any deformation or scratches at all. So this speaks volume to the heat treatment and the scientific edge geometry required for this kind of large sword because you're going to have some mishaps handling the sword same can be said about uh, battlefield situations back 500 years ago, so it has to be durable enough than the average arming sword or long swords. So overall, I would say this Maximilian Zweihander uh, from the 15th century is well worth the money. It's well researched, well designed. It combines many Germanic swords risen hilt component with a very typical broad cutting oriented blade. Now, if you prefer some of the more traditional blade geometries on 200 swords, you can also check out other offerings, such as the reproduction of the Wallace collection and the Royal Armouries one. Obviously, those are very different swords, even though they have comparable sizes. I wholeheartedly recommend the Albion Maximilian. But if the Tyrolean and the Archduke is more to your personal flavor, Obviously, you can check those out. Their qualities have to be on par with the Maximilian. If you enjoyed this review, find any value or entertainment, please like and subscribe. And I greatly enjoy this opportunity to collaborate with Matthew Jensen. Matthew's own review of the Maximilian is released today. Make sure to check out his unique takes on the sword. Link in the description below.